Hello everybody. Welcome to a special program that the Hardwick Gazette and HCTV are jointly doing to bring you interviews of the candidates in Vermont's primary election. The primary this year is August 13th. We'll be interviewing all the candidates in four Senate districts and five House districts that the 11 towns of the Hardwick Gazette are uh, represented by. So, You'll be able to watch these at hctv.us or read them at hardwickgazette.org and each uh, place will be linked to the other. So we'll bring you now interviews of your local candidates. Thanks for watching. Okay. Um, well, I'm currently, I'm a, I'm a systems engineer. That's what I've been for the past uh, 20 years, an IT systems engineer. Um, I have, uh, I run a, um, a group called No Carbon Tax Vermont, who's for the past six, eight years, uh, we've been pretty active um, in, uh, at the state house around legislation uh, that has to do with carbon taxes, fees, and, and those sorts of mandates. Um, I have um, a history of, um, so in, early on, I worked for AmeriCorps when I was younger, um, building um, uh, building uh, access for um, disabled elderly folks, that sort of thing. And, uh, and also some of my early stuff was, you know, I've worked in the field of addictions. Um, I worked at a... Um, an inpatient adolescent um, addictions facility when I was younger in my twenties, and um, and and so I've gotten, you know, uh, I've touched on um, some of the addiction problems in our community. Um, so I've also worked at the alcohol crisis uh, team in Burlington years ago. So you know, I've touched, uh, you know, I know we have a we've got an addiction problem, and so um, uh, it's important that I mention that. Um, I also, um, uh, I would say my experience in systems engineering helps me a lot in that it's basically, um, you know, troubleshooting difficult, difficult problems pretty regularly. I pay attention to the, uh, to the issues at hand and I'm, I'm pretty regularly involved in, in discussions around the economics of how we sort of run things in Vermont. Um, so, um, you know, I would say that I bring a fresh perspective. Um, I'm not a uh, person that's going to be interested in a, a career uh, in politics, um, but I am a person that's going to be uh, fully dedicated um, for the next couple of years were I to be elected um, uh, for this position. And um, I would just say uh, that um, I think that we need a bold voice in there. And I don't think that the voices that are in there currently are speaking bold enough in that. I think I feel like um, Vermonters have been pushed around pretty significantly by the what I would say, refer to them as the super majority. So, so my name is Scott Beck, and um, my background is I'm a lifelong Vermonter. Um, but as I tell people, the first 30 years of my life, I spent a lot of time outside of Vermont. My father was in the Navy and I was in the Navy as well. Uh, but I moved back here permanently in 1999. Um, I'm an educator. I've been an educator for 25 years in Vermont. I've taught mathematics and social studies. And I'm a 20 year business owner in downtown St. Johnsbury. My wife and I own the, the bookstore. Um, and, a, and countless organizations that I volunteer my time with and lead with. My experience is directly related to the, the job that I'm seeking is, uh, for 10 years I've been the representative of uh, Caledonia Essex, which is a district that includes Concord, Kirby, and St. Johnsbury. And during that time I've served on, served on the House of Committee on Education and the House Committee on Ways and Means. Um, and that district is a, is a purple district. Uh, and I, I feel like the Caledonia district is a purple district as well. So I'm, I'm very comfortable and very used to uh, representing a district that um, has a very broad uh, spectrum of political opinions and ideas. And I'm very comfortable at trying to um, carve out 
the middle of that district and make the middle of that district as as big as I can so that I'm representing as many people as I can. Uh, that does often lead to me uh, being yelled at by the, uh, the edges of the political conversation, and I'm okay with that. Um, I'm a believer that if you're getting yelled at by both sides, then you're probably right about where you want you should be. Um, so I feel very comfortable in that situation. Again, I think that the Caledonia district is a, is a very purple district, uh, very political spectrum is very broad and there's a lot of people on either edge and I'm very comfortable in, in representing a district like that and, and seeking that big middle um, where most of the political conversation is. All right, I'm Sean Hallisey. I'm from Waterford, Vermont. I'm a nursing home administrator by trade. Because of that, I understand economics, finances, and budgets. I also understand compromise and consensus to solve problems with groups of people. That's one reason why I'm an excellent candidate. I'm also an excellent candidate because I got into the race on my own. Nobody appointed me. I went out in a day and a half, collected 175 signatures. I've been going door to door, and I'm very ecstatic and humbled by the response I'm getting. I've been from Wheelock to Newberry, and I have over 100 signs, and I've probably given out over 1,000 pamphlets. Okay, well I can say that I was very lucky to live in a home where I had unconditional love and I think that um, not everybody has that and I will say that's how I was lucky to start out. Um, I also have um, a family that was a, a blended family, so I have two older siblings and one younger sibling and I was kind of always in the middle, which sometimes meant that um, you know, I needed to play diplomat when it came to important things like who had the remote control. Um, but it also meant that, um, you know, when things got tougher in our, in our family, we had to deal with um, some real challenges around financial issues or my sister's, you know, intense mental health that I was able to um, kind of step up and be that, that voice to kind of help um, my, my family and to help um, uh, you know, be a leader around those topics. And so um, I think because of that, I ended up moving into a career that had um, a lot to do with supporting and helping other people. And so at 22, I was working at WISE in the Upper Valley, which supported survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Um, and I, you know, remember experiencing really the resilience of um, women who had to leave a really violent situation. I, I remember um, being really moved by that and how, how strong they had to be to, um, to do that. And so that really helped me find my purpose and really um, underscored my interest and need to support others, uh, especially those in need. So um, that actually led to me getting my MBA in nonprofit management. Um, so that I could work to, on behalf of others, but really do so in a way that was going to use finances in the most efficient uh, way possible. Um, and so I did that um, in many different fields. I ended up pursuing um, leadership in uh, fields related to child welfare, domestic and sexual violence, um, substance misuse, and environmental justice, and other topics. And so I was able to, um, to gain experience. I've been now at Umbrella, which is an organization that serves most of the Northeast Kingdom. I've been there for six and a half years as its executive director. And so I feel like um, you know, my experience and really my passion for supporting others has brought me here. So when um, Jane Kitchell asked me to run, I was honored, um, you know, to be able to continue her, her moderate voice um, in, the, in the state legislature. But it's really been my path that has brought me to this moment from when I was growing up in my family and to my work experience. That is why I'm here to pursue this, um, this, this Senate seat. Well, um, as far as um, taxes go, you know, um, this is what I feel is I feel like Right now, we have a supermajority that makes, you know, the majority of the big decisions on the direction that we we go in. And I feel like um, that a lot of the ideas that come out of the supermajority are very compassionate. Um, I don't agree with uh, some of them, um, but they're very compassionate. Um, I think the problem is, is that when we get in this mindset of where we should be paying for everything that's compassionate, we end up in a situation where we overspend. And so a little bit like, you know, our home budgets, we need to be conscious of our, um, the budgets, um, you know, at the state house. And as far as the school, uh, you know, school, um, affordability is uh, the utmost important. Um, we 
have a major problem again with Act 127. And I think um, what we have to do is um, we have to put more skin in the game for the local, um, have more skin in the game for the local towns in that um, there are, um, you know, I do like the way that we use a foundation and weights um, style. Um, but what I would say is that we can't be, we have to agree on the weights. We can't change. Um, we can't bloat um, things up so that they change in the middle of the year. Um, so I guess that's what I'm trying to say is we got to hold fast with what we agree on, not change it until we all agree that we want to change it, that we want to change. And so otherwise I believe in a foundation and weights approach. I also very much agree that it should be include all uh, student age children, not just public school children. This should include homeschool children as well. And there are um, some great ways to um, hold fast on affordability there, too. Well, taxation is a byproduct of spending. Uh, there's no way to get around that. And the um, spending increases in the state of Vermont in the pre-K through, through, pre through 12 system have been very aggressive the last two or three years. They're up 11% this year, and that translates into, into taxes and property taxes. I think that what's really important in this whole conversation is, is that um, transparency. And what I mean by that is, is our current education funding system, which is, I would argue, and not many people would, um, would, would necessarily agree with this, it, it's a wonderful system. But there are three problems with it. Um, and they all relate to transparency. Transparency for school districts that have to put these budgets together, and transparency for voters that have to approve these budgets. Um, one of the issues with transparency was actually solved this year. Um, I identified it, I put the language in, I solved it. And it's common level of appraisal reform. Uh, the common level of appraisal, the way it was being calculated, gave districts and voters a very false understanding of the cost of money. Um, the second thing is to more closely connect the school district to the local, the local tax rate. Right now, it is very loosely connected. We can easily solve that problem by redefining what counts as education spending and making it equal to what homestead taxpayers pay. The, that work, that language has advanced multiple times in the House and into the Senate. It has not yet been uh, passed into law, but I think we're about one more year I think I can get that done. Then that again is, is all my work. And then the last thing that I think really needs to happen so that Vermonters can understand how this tax education tax system works is we need to do property tax credit reform. Right now, Vermonters across the board, they have no idea how their tax bill is calculated. Is it based on income? Is it based on property? Is it based on both? What are the, you know, there's all kinds of thresholds and everything. It's so terribly confusing. If we just went to a simple model where you pay your property taxes in the fall and you get a credit in the spring when you file your income taxes, we could make this so that Vermonters could understand it. Well, first off, I have to say that money's not endless. We don't grow $100 bills out in an orchard and just go pick them. So we have to be careful with the priorities that we take up. Schooling and education is very important because if our kids aren't competitive when they get out in the workforce, then our county and our country won't be competitive when it comes to economics in the world and in the state. I'm prepared to go there and advocate for reducing property taxes, stopping the double digit property tax increases and I believe if the state legislature mandates something on the school system, then that money needs to come out of the general fund to help afford it. I think um, it's a really important question. It's one of uh, the main reasons why, you know, I think this race is of highest, you know, interest and concern um, because property taxes are too high. People cannot afford to pay the taxes that are being presented with them today. Um, and there's all sorts of reasons for that, and certainly fingers can be pointed in many directions. Um, and they often get pointed in many directions. Um, I think the, the solution needs to be, isn't just gonna come from one direction. The solution needs to be um, really 
um, from school boards that are looking at their school budgets. It's going to be from community members that understand, um, you know, that there 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 is going to be property taxes, and there's from from the the legislature as well that realizes that there needs to be compromise on some of these 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 challenges and these these funding needs that we have. And so, um, you know, I wish that there was a real simple solution and a real simple um, way that we could make um, property taxes lower. But I do know that it's very important and it's going to take something it's going to take people who are able to um, talk to one another across the aisle that are able to collaborate to that are able to listen deeply to one another um, in order to um, make make change um, people who have been there today they haven't they haven't figured this problem out right it's actually it's gotten pretty bad in the last couple of years for all sorts of reasons including covid um, but we have the opportunity now to look at this issue and and make better make make better choices and hard choices um, the education piece i believe that um, can be really complicated but i think our schools um, and our kids deserve really high class and wonderful education and, and i believe they need it needs to be uh, decided in community by community. Uh, the community education needs to look different in St. Johnsbury than it does in Danville, to, than it does in Hardwick. And I believe we need to uh, make sure that our local control of our schools and how um, and what's funded and how it's funded re remains. Um, but in terms of the spending piece, we need more compromise and we need to figure out how to be able to be sustainable in terms of our uh, expenses. Huh. That's a challenge. Um, the attraction for, well, it's not going to be attractive to young people until we aren't struggling. And right now, Vermont is struggling. And so there, there isn't a lot of answers for young people, as sad as that sounds. Um, as far as um, our, our housing crisis, I think it's a housing crisis from top to bottom. And I would look at things like um, the laws that we have in place. Uh, Act 250 was originally uh, established to slow uh, the growth of, of Vermont when it came to you know, folks wanted to keep Vermont the way it used to be and the way the old ways. And I can appreciate that, too. But now it's time that we um, we grow a little bit. I think we need to make a hole in Act 250 for housing from top to bottom. It would as much of a housing boom as we can create. I think it would be it would be great. And I and I, I will caveat into the homelessness crisis in that if there isn't enough, I already know that there isn't enough homeless. I mean, there aren't enough homes for folks that even want to move around. Somebody that just wants to move from one place to another place. It doesn't exist. It's very difficult in my, many places in Vermont and very expensive. So I think that uh, relieving some of the regulation in Act 250, while being very careful of our flood um, uh, uh, mitigation, um, we probably ought to be very careful where we build so that we're not... Um, creating more problems for our future Vermonters um, with, with floods. We just have to start thinking about resiliency when it comes to floods. And, and I believe that opening things up like this will feed homes to the, from the top to the bottom. There's always going to be some homeless people that want to stay homeless, but those that don't are going to start finding apartments available once we start building. And it shouldn't all be government projects. We'll do what we can with government projects, but usually government projects don't work out well in the long run when it comes to housing, from what I've seen? Well, I think it, it's really important whenever you do policy work um, in homeless, uh, homelessness and housing is, is a huge part of people's lives. You have to identify what the problem is. And what the problem is, is that the ownership options that people have and the rental options that people have, they are too, they are too expensive for the average incomes that Vermonters earn. And that is, that is the, the problem. So to take the, the housing side of that equation, um, we need to do a, a number of things to bring down the cost of housing. Um, just throwing more dollars at the problem from government isn't going to solve the cost of housing. I think there's a number of things that we can do to bring down the cost of housing. One is um, regu regulatory reform to make it easier um, for people to actually build a home or to renovate a home, to take out some of that red tape or those soft costs, which people say are 30% of the cost of building. Um, I also think that we need to, whilst many people would love to have a, a one-off, unique, custom home on 10 acres of land. I think that's a dream for some people. Um, that's probably not a cost-effective model for most people that are trying to enter the housing market, especially young people. 
we need to have you know mass produced housing on smaller plots of land um, and do it in such a way that it still fits the Vermont landscape and our and our city landscapes and then I think the other thing that I think would be really helpful is to really put some emphasis on the mass timber approach um, it it's it's inexpensive we buy that lumber from people in Vermont um, it's good it, you know less carbon to produce it less transportation costs I know when I built my home I did a lot of mass timber and it saved me a tremendous amount of money on the cost of the home and I'm really proud that my home has a lot of Vermont birch in it first off in regards to housing it's got to be very important that we do not overdevelop our state we're at a crossroads we don't have enough money to afford our government but we also do not want to end up in urban sprawl or suburban sprawl. There was just an Act 250 put forward where we were discussing about development in dense areas such as the city or the downtown of Hardwick, such as St. Johnsbury, the downtown of St. Johnsbury. That's where it needs to be done. We need to protect the farmland for agriculture, forestry, and fish and game. Those are vital parts of our economy and our lifestyle. And again, we need to keep that because it's wonderful where we live. You know, I think housing is one of the most, again, a very important issue and one that's high on my list of priorities. Um, when I think about issues that are facing Vermonters in our district, for sure, you need affordable housing. You need um, housing to attract um, workers to our community um, while also ensuring that we have housing that's affordable for people who already live here um, and want to re remain here, including young people who um, you know, a lot of a lot of the best employees at Umbrella right now right, are like young people who have come back to Vermont often after leaving for college and things like that. So we want to make sure there's housing for them. Um, you know, in terms of how to do that, you know, there really needs to be a you know multifaceted planning on how to do that. We really need to ensure that. Um, new housing is built. You know, there simply isn't enough housing stock in this region um, to sustain, you know, any kind of significant growth or even um, to retain a lot of the families who are looking for housing now and a lot of people who are losing, looking for housing now. So I think we need to continue on looking at building dense housing, uh, particularly in, in, in town centers and city centers um, as they are in our district and not necessarily um, looking to build, you know, further out uh, away from services. A lot of the housing that um, needs to be developed should be for folks to access schools, to, to access um, walkable uh, amenities and things like that. A lot of folks don't have vehicles, um, and so it's important for them to have access to services, food, um, you know, markets, things like that. So I think we need to really look at housing um, and be smart about it. You can get kind of many benefits from, you know, looking at your your town core for your housing. Um, you can get, you know, climate change uh, benefits from that when you're really looking at um, building uh, in towns. Mm. Well, the, the homelessness crisis is a major challenge. And so all I can say is that my answer really does harken back to, you know, regulation. If we don't have enough houses, we really aren't going to have spaces for everybody and people are going to struggle. Um, I do wonder what the repercussions are of having a strong, as we have a pretty strong welfare system. Um, I just wonder... Um, how much of that welfare system kind of draws people in while it's kind of a trap because there's not, there's, there aren't homes for people. So I think that we end up in kind of a, a challenge there where we might be drawing people over to us saying, Hey, we can help, help, help. But in reality, we're not really taking the the important steps to, to build, to build homes. And when I say build, we can't just run out and build. We have to carefully consider our, our regulations. And I would like to see us deregulate a lot when it comes to real estate. Uh, you know, we need houses from top to bottom. So that's what I would just reiterate. Well, the solution is more housing stock. You know, more housing stock for, for people to move in and more housing stock where the supply actually meets the demand will help with the affordability of housing. I know um, I've had you know, recent conversations with uh, Northeast Kingdom Community Action, NECA, which serves this area. And they're, they're having a tremendous, it's, it's very heartening, they're having a tremendous amount of success 
uh, bringing homeless people into a new shelter that's been opened up down in East St. Johnsbury, um, stabilizing them, um, getting them the care and, and what they need to, to uh, stabilize their themselves or their household, and then getting them onto a more permanent um, setting, uh, a home or an apartment, where they, um, as a stabilized family or as a stabilized individual, they can go there and, um, you know, and re-enter um, the world as a, you know, a full person with, with housing. Um, and so, you know, I think that that model works. You know, these people, a lot of times, they end up in this situation through no fault of their own, and we need to get them stabilized. We need to take them in for a period of time and then get them to a stable um, housing situation that works for, for them or their family. And um, I, I think that model doesn't seem overly complicated and I think it sounds like it could work in a lot of areas of the, the state and I'd like to see it uh, duplicated. Well, first off, I'm very concerned about the homeless population because it's popping up on riverbanks in St. Johnsbury. It's popping up on the rail trail all over the state and along with that comes drugs and alcohol and problems that end up needing the police so one thing we need to do is we need to beef up the police force in st johnsbury they have more cars than they have policemen so we need that we need more policemen we need to figure out what the homeless really want oftentimes we try to help people and solve their problems but they don't really want it to be solved so we need to have a better mental health system. We need to have a better interview system to find out what the homeless people need in order to move forward and become viable citizens within our society. Um, the homeless um, issue is something I'm, I'm pretty familiar with and um, certainly know that that's something that we want to really work on and change. And in a small state like Vermont, you can actually really make an impact and, and change the amount, of, the amount of homeless people that are on the, on the street, particularly children. Um, and so that's definitely an issue of interest for me. Um, and at, at Umbrella, where I'm the executive director, um, we currently run a program that, um, a shelter program for people fleeing domestic violence, and we get funded through the state to do that. But the reason why it's a, it was a great idea for them to fund us to do that is because we're able to do, do that for a lot less money than motels, for example. So we're able to house folks in a community uh, apartments, um, essentially, at a much reduced rate than motels. And so I think the more we're able to shift motel spending, which can be really exorbitant, um, you know, I know it can sometimes in some communities it's the only solution for homelessness, but a lot more cost efficiencies can go into housing folks in communities and, and in apartments. Um, a lot of communities, including St. Johnsbury, have, have also opened um, homeless shelters. Again, another cost-effective way to help people as they're um, in their homeless moments. They're not homeless forever, they're not homeless people, they just have a, don't have a house right now um, or, a, or a place, you know, a roof over their head. Um, and so being able to have homeless shelters in communities is also another cost-effective way to reduce the expense on, on um, hotel rooms. Um, and it's also something where you can help people with services, um, like at Umbrella's you know, emergency shelter, but also at homeless shelters. You can help them get connected to other long-term housing options so that they're off the street permanently. Um, and so I think through the wraparound support and through moving towards community-based solutions like apartments that are managed by other organizations, um, that can help alleviate some of that cost associated with the homeless population. Well, the first part, I would say, um, as far as the funding goes, I think a lot of what we're putting into climate change and climate, um, I think I would like to see, if we're, what I would like to see is I would like to see us building resiliency into our water treatment centers. Our water treatment centers are seemingly overflowing every time we have um, a significant storm. I wouldn't even say a major storm, but rather a significant storm. I know St. Johnsbury had its um, water treatment center completely overwhelmed with water. Um, and they had dumped more than 100,000 gallons of um, partially treated effluent. And some places were dumping stuff we don't even want to talk about. So there was a lot of that stuff going into the rivers. 
And what I hear is, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see us investing. If we're going to invest in environment, let's, you know, we can't do anything about the climate. What we can do is we can build resiliency into Vermont where we can actually see it. And that means possibly separating our stormwater in some ways from the water that comes out of our residential um, these are. This is not an inexpensive thing, but look, they're so willing to throw everything at climate change. How about we start, you know, taking a lot of initiatives, throwing it at things that we can actually see and feel and change on the ground? Like, how can we talk about climate when we have so much um, of this? I, I don't know. Um, water treatment. I, you got to call it untreated feces and stuff going into our our our, our rivers and streams. So. I guess that's what where I would go with that is I would just build. Um, we basically need to take that on. It's a hard one, but we need to take it on, and um, and we need to stop making such a crisis out of the climate and start making more of a crisis out of the fact that we've got all this going into the river. Well, I think you know resilience is it's going to be on a community by community basis. Nobody nobody knows uh, their community and their own infrastructure better. Um, than the, the towns and the, um, the road commissioners. Uh, and in a lot of cases, people that have lived there their whole lives, especially farmers that have really seen the, the, um, the land evolve and the rivers evolve. Uh, this is my, uh, since I announced my um, candidacy, this is my eighth trip to um, Hardwick. And, and just in those last six weeks, uh, the river has changed in this community. It's creeping in on uh, Buffalo Mountain Co-op and other really valuable um, um, really valuable properties in, in Hardwick. So we, you know, we need to, to listen to the communities. We also need to listen to the rivers. You know, they're, they're, those rivers are telling us where they want to go. And if they're going, trying to go in places that we don't think that we want them to go, well, we have to come up with a strategy to get them to go places that will not harm the community. And I think we really need to think hard about that. I think, um, I think debris removal is a big part of this equation. As they drive into Hardwick, uh, your river, it looks like in places it's filled with boulders. And I think that debris removal should be on the table. Um, and even beyond that, maybe even selective dredging. Secretary Moore embraced that um, idea in a press conference a couple of weeks ago. So I think you know, those are all really important. Uh, as far as you know, how are we going to maintain all this infrastructure, roads, bridges, things that people need to um, drive around, um, and you mentioned that uh, people are uh, transitioning to electric vehicles. I purchased one just a couple weeks ago. Uh, the legislature this past year passed a fee that EV owners would pay in lieu of the gas tax to, um, to fund our road system. And, um, but that's just the first step in a transition. We need to rethink the whole funding process, but we're making, we made a step this year. First off, I wanna say that I've been going door to door from Wheelock to Newberry and I can tell you that Vermonters are very resilient and they're not willing to break down or fall down, whether it's the weather or otherwise. It's important for us to make sure that we repair our roads so that people can travel and get from point A to point B. It's important to repair our roads so that we can have commerce. Commerce, also tourism. That brings tax dollars to our state and with increased tax dollars, we're able to afford needed repairs. Yeah, so I think climate resilience um, is, is gonna be really important. It already is important now, but as we move ahead in the coming years, it's going to be essential that we really invest in understanding how we can be better resilient so that we can withstand these inevitable climate shifts that are occurring. Um, you know, there, there are things that maybe we have been doing, we want to continue to do, but there are new pieces that I think we're going to need to really um, invest in determining and creating plans for, including how we're, you know, navigating uh, river, um, you know, how rivers expand and when that happens and how we can maybe look at um, what other areas have done and other states have done and how we can maybe get some federal support in looking at, um, helping to minimize and prevent some of the, the, um, the issues that happen because of climate change. 
Um, you know, I think we, whatever policy that we have related to resilience and re related to climate change, we're going to really need to make sure that we're not, um, that we're centering people who are the most vulnerable to those climate change impacts, particularly those um, at lower socioeconomic um, ends of the, of the scale. Um, too often, you know, we think of solutions that, um, that might be on the backs of those who already have like really, um, are really, um, financially strained from month to month and adding more taxes onto their bank account, you know, to their uh, bills is not necessarily the answer. We need to come up with solutions that that don't do that um, while understanding it's still a really important issue and needs to happen. Um, you know, so, and I think in terms of electric vehicles and, and the strains that are, are coming along there, I know that's an issue here in Hardwick, for example. Um, a lot of folks um, aren't able to access the kind of infrastructure that's needed to sustain their electric vehicles if they have them, for example. Um, and that will, those kinds of improvements will happen. They'll, they'll take a little bit more time. Um, but we can't just think about those kinds of solutions to climate change. We have to think about less driving. We have to think about, um, you know, building communities where uh, we're not set up for, uh, that we need multiple cars and families, that we need um, to be driving um, as much. We, again, really focusing on that town center uh, is a place where I think can help us with climate mitigation as well. Okay. Um, well, where I would stand, where I do stand on that is, um, well, we were in a, um, I think where Vermont stood for a long time is um, that abortion was legal for someone in the first trimester. And, and that's, I think, if I feel comfortable in a place, that's, I would say, safely, that's the position that I would take is that in the first trimester, I feel as if unless there's some unforeseen thing that that I can't explain right now, but I know there's always a thing, you know, some drastic thing that you know, health wise or something like that. I mean, obviously we want everybody coming out with a healthy outcome, you know? Um, but yeah, I would say um, first trimester is about the extent of what I feel comfortable supporting. Well, Vermont, um, since 1973, um, the Supreme court has prevented the legislature from restricting uh, abortion in the state of Vermont. And that's been the landscape here for 51 years. Um, I was um, a sponsor of the underlying legislation, House Bill 57, that um, uh, clearly said that um, Vermont would have no say in abortion rights in, in, uh, in the state. Uh, and I voted for that bill twice in the, uh, in the legislature. Um, and I also voted for the amendment that clearly um, stated that, uh, that women would um, would make decisions on that topic and voted for it at the polls. And, you know, my guiding thought uh, in that whole conversation is, is that um, I, I just fundamentally, uh, I trust women and doctors far more than I do the government. So for me, um, that's a comfortable place to be. I think women and doctors are where those decisions should, should lie. Um, as far as the conversation at the national level, um, it, 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 it hurts me uh, to, you know, with Roe v. Wade uh, being pushed aside, that there are states that um, uh, women's freedoms and rights have been uh, greatly restricted relative to where they were before um, that decision. And I, um, but I'm also heartened that um, in those states that, that uh, they've pushed back and seen some, some real um, real victories at the ballot box to push back for those rights. I think it's unfortunate that they have to, to do that, but, um, but I'm, I'm, you know, as a Vermonter, I'm, I'm happy where we are in Vermont right now on that topic. Plain and simple, it's a woman's right to choose, and it's nobody else's responsibility, not the government, not God's, not anybody's responsibility to tell a woman what she should do with her body. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, being, uh, again, the director of Umbrella, an organization that supports um, people who've experienced domestic and sexual violence, among other uh, social issues that we, that we deal with. Um, you know, women's right to choose is something that's 
really related to body autonomy, related to women's health care. Um, it is something that is very important to me, and I know a lot of um, a lot of folks, a lot of Vermonters. And you know, with the current presidential election, um, certainly has many of us concerned, scared. Um, you know, really worried for, for our future uh, in our country, really worried for uh, our daughters, um, ourselves, and, other, and other, other states, our sisters in other states. Are, so it's a, it's a primary concern. You know, we've been lucky that Vermont has been um, pretty strident in terms of ensuring access, you know, to safe um, abortions. And we, um, in any policy that continues to ensure, no matter what the national politics you know, whatever ends up happening kind of on the national scale, that our um, policies will ensure that Vermonters will have access to abortion and they will also have access to, um, you know, contraceptives and, and everything related to um, women's health. That, that is really the standard of care um, and that our medical professionals um, put forward as a standard of care in women's health. Uh, affordability is my most important issue. And I think it's everybody's most important issue right now. Um, I feel as if, you know, I think if, if what I've said hasn't been clear enough, I'm against the carbon tax and um, fees and, and really mandates in general. Uh, they just, I feel like they just hurt Vermonters and they're not going to help. And in the long run, they're just, they're not the right way to go. And um, as far as electric vehicles goes, what I would say is that they should pay their fair share. They weigh a thousand pounds more than uh, the average uh, car. And um, so they should pay their fair share. I don't want to subsidize um, electric vehicles. And I would vote if I were a state senator in the future, I would vote to, that we don't subsidize electric vehicles. I feel like that's a, not a good investment for um, Vermonters struggling with affordability. You know, I'm running because... You know, I have two children and, uh, you know, one's 13, one's 20. And, you know, it was the first thing that we touched on was what are the young people going to do? Um, you know, I'm worried for my kids that they aren't going to stay. And I'm pretty sure they won't. And probably if I want the best for them, I'll encourage them to go do what they got to do. Um, I want them back here, but there's not a lot of uh, opportunity here. We got to we got to build back Vermont. I guess that would be a, a good slogan. It's not my slogan, but... <laughs> Yeah. Let's build back Vermont and let's be a little bit more conscious of how we spend our money. Well, I guess just that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm experienced at this. I know, I know exactly what I'm getting into. Um, I have, I have done this for 10 years in the, the house. I'm the only candidate that can say that. Uh, I believe I'm the only candidate that can say I'm a, I'm a small business owner, um, and an educator. Uh, I'm a hands-on person. I, uh, uh, in my community, I, you know, dig in, I'm on the, you know, I, I'm not on the boards where people show up in a uh, shirt and tie and in an air-conditioned boardroom. I'm the person up there trying to make sure that the ice rink gets open every year or make sure the Kiwanis Pool in St. Johnsbury gets open for its 81st year so kids can get Red Cross swimming lessons. Or um, until recently, I was the, the groundskeeper for the, uh, the baseball fields in the area in St. Johnsbury. And so I'm a really hands-on type of person. I like to you know, be in the community and really mixing it up and uh, working for, um, you know, a lot of, I guess a lot of what I do is really related to, to youth and making this community a better place for youth. And I, I think that that experience and my experience as a business owner and an educator and 10 years of experience as a legislator in the Vermont State House uh, has really, really prepared me well um, to take this, to take on this uh, new responsibility um, in the Vermont Senate, and I hope that uh, uh, people in the Caledonia District um, see that. Um, and I'll, I'm out all the time, I'm knocking on doors, and um, and, and, I, and I welcome them to uh, to talk to me about that or any other subject and, and challenge me, because I think that uh, this this job um, you should be challenged when you're making uh, votes that really impact people's lives. Well, I think it's very important for everybody to know that I um, want to protect agriculture, forestry, and fish and game, and our way of life here. We have a beautiful way of life, and we don't want it to be taken over by urban and suburban sprawl. I think it's important for people to know that there are a lot of issues that need to be put on the table. One of them 
is the prison system. A possibility to save money there in two ways. One, we import prisoners from other states to our state. When they get out of jail, they don't have the money to go back to where they came from. They end up out on our streets and on our public programs, and that costs a lot of money to the taxpayers. We should stop immediately importing prisoners. We shouldn't export prisoners either, because I'm sure when we export them, we pay top dollar for their keep in another state, and we need to be more conservative and responsible with our money. The second thing I want to bring up is that I am a Democrat. I'm a middle-of-the-road, conservative, old-style, blue-dog Democrat from the 70s. And we need to start immediately next session with a caucus with the progressives from the other side of the state, because like I said earlier, we cannot spend ourselves silly. Money is not infinite. It, it, it is only so much to go around, and we need to make sure that we're looking at all the programs that help our citizens, and we need to get the best bang for our buck. I think it's important for um, potential supporters to understand that just because I'm a Democrat and I've worked in the nonprofit field for my uh, career, that you know I really value uh, you know being reasonable, common sense related to spending and related to. Um, uh, how we use our public funding because um, it's something that sometimes people might assume, oh, I bet they would like to spend a lot of money because they're the Democrat. No, I mean, I really think of myself as a moderate Democrat, and that's a really, I think, an important role for someone in the Senate today in Montpelier to have, to be a moderate Democrat and to be that, carry that voice that Jane Kitchell had in the Senate, um, to be that voice, um, to really be, again, pragmatic and really look at issue to issue and think about how this could impact Vermonters despite party, really, and, and really thinking about the values that, that are important uh, here and, and in all of Vermont. Um, so I think I'd like you know to ensure that people understand that that um, I understand that pro you know property tax and, um, and and that the additional taxes can really burden people and so I think I share that concern with my other um, my colleagues who are running for this seat um, and so when you look at the the, the candidates in front of you think about. Um, you know, who do you think could be persuasive? Who do you think could really be a strong voice, um, you know, in the Senate um, as it stands now? You know, someone who's, who can really speak to some of the, the issues that, um, that I've experienced through my work and through, through my life, um, you know, are the other candidates. And I, and I hope that you will consider that um, in your selection, and I really hope to earn your vote.